If you're learning to code or you're a seasoned software developer, I'm gonna tell you about the five emerging things that you need to know about C-Sharp. Today's episode is brought to you by fizzbuzzenergy.com. When you need to hit that deadline, grab some coding energy in a can. Tastes great and makes the ultimate desktop accessory. Go to fizzbuzzenergy.com. Here at Coder Foundry, we're big advocates for C-Sharp. We feel like it's the best platform that you can code with to break into that new job. No, we're not supported by Microsoft, but we really believe the platform holds a lot of promise for young developers and senior developers alike. Having said that, with .NET Core 3.0 and the emerging .NET 5 that'll be out and later in November 2020, um, there is a unique position of these technologies that are coming out. And we want to highlight five essential areas that we think everyone, whether you're a junior or a senior, should be aware of. So let's look at those five technologies that you need to know about. So with every year, there's a lot of emerging tech out there that you want to investigate. And I think one of the most important ones right now that we can look into that you should be aware of if you've not already investigate is WebAssembly. Now Microsoft is pushing something out called Blazor, which Blazor allows us to run C Sharp in the browser. But WebAssembly promises things like type safety from the language. It also promises more performance than pure JavaScript. Um, but it also allows you to take those skills that you already have in C Sharp and then push them to the client side. Now Blazor is going to come in two flavors. One is Blazor server side and also Blazor client side. I think Blazor client side, which is still in preview and won't be in production until late next year, has the most intrigue among us because we can finally get rid of JavaScript in the browser. So we think it holds a lot of promise. And if people start asking you to build apps with Blazor and WebAssembly, it's something that you can start learning right now. So go look at the previews, go look at tutorials. Um, we've done a couple here on the channel here, and it's just, just something that you need to pay attention to so that you're not trying to play catch up after everyone else is starting building WebAssembly type applications. Now, sometimes you're building something and you don't want to roll out a whole web server to do it. It's maybe it's small or just a, a piece of code that you want someone else to call, maybe an API or something like that. And serverless functions are a great way to do that. Service functions allow you to execute code without having to deploy the entire infrastructure around it, the entire web server, something like that. Right now, you can do it in a couple of ways. You can do it on AWS called Lambda Functions. Netlify has Netlify functions, which are built on top of Amazon. And you also have Azure functions. And that's the thing that we want you to pay attention to. Because the difference between Azure functions and something like at AWS is that you can use C Sharp to build your function and execute it. You also have great tooling support inside of Visual Studio, so you can actually run the function locally. And that's a big problem sometimes when you're trying to test these and before you deploy them, is how do I run this locally? Makes it real easy inside of Visual Studio. And we think Azure Functions is a way for you to deploy something small and compact to an environment and you don't have to spend as much money hosting a complete web server. I think that clients, employers, and things like that are going to be looking forward to you to build these types of environments. So right now is a good time to invest learning and looking into what Azure Functions can provide for you, your clients, your customers, your employer, or whatever. So check out Azure Functions and it's something that you're probably going to be doing next year. So a lot of the work that we're doing right now as software devs is building services. Now inside of the C Sharp stack, we use something called Web API to do that. And a lot of those services are what we call RESTful services. And those are built on a stack called HTTP. And that's pretty much how the internet has been founded on for since I can remember. Now 2015, HTTP was updated to HTTP2. And you're probably asking, why is that important? Well, it gave us a couple of things that are very kind of like revolutionary. Number one, it's going to allow us to run simultaneous requests so that our requests over the web can be more performant. And that's very exciting. So now everyone has an average of 11 megs of bandwidth across the US. But, but the problem is latency. HTTP gives a promise of removing latency from these kind of communications. And that means that your app will run faster. So you're probably gonna see people start saying, hey, can you support HTTP2? With .NET Core 3, now that's kind of native and we can do that. The other thing that's coming down the pipe that's kind of buried in the specification is 
how information is transferred between the two points. And that's using something called protocol buffers or pro buffers from Google. And that allows us to um, submit data in a binary package that is going to be smaller, more lightweight, and therefore our transfers will be faster. With HTTP 1, that is a text type format, which you see in JSON or something like that. So it's a lot easier to consume these proto buffers and, and over the JSON libraries. And it's not that that's hard, it's just that there is now a better way or maybe a more performant way to do that. I think going forward, we're going to use both of these. But there may be a lot of things, a lot of cases where you're building microservices, and this is the architecture that you're going to be asked to use. So check out Web Vita and support for HTTP2. So let's talk about the death of web forms. You were my brother, Anakin. I loved you. WebForms was not ported from .NET 3.0. So that means that going forward as the new frameworks come out, Microsoft is not going to support WebForms. Now, let's say you've built your entire career on WebForms development, which is probably true for a lot of people. You've been doing it for 20 years or 15 years or whatever. Um, and these types of changes can make people upset. They're like, why are they doing this? Um, and so what I want you to think about it is, it's not so much that Microsoft is going away from WebForms as it presents you with an opportunity to get new work and do new things. And so MVC and Razor Pages are the technologies you need to look into because what are people going to do? They're going to take these web form projects and they're going to rewrite them or retool them in the newer design patterns like MVC or Razor Pages. So if you're positioned well to be able to take on this new rewrite work, it's going to make you very busy for the next couple of years. I think that you should look at it as a very good opportunity to take the new tooling, MVC and Razor Pages, and start helping people convert these web form projects into the newer design patterns. Um, don't look at it as something that Microsoft's doing you wrong. Look at it as an opportunity to learn something new and get new work, have new clients, new companies, new whatever, and embrace the change and adopt MVC and Razor Pages. Now, Microsoft sometimes gets a bad rap for only working on Windows. And a lot of our comments from from you guys on the YouTube channel is talking about, hey, what about Linux? What about this? What about that? Microsoft isn't open source. And I want to tell you that's kind of maybe true in the past, but now it's definitely a myth now because of things like Docker or containers. So if you don't know what this is, this is definitely something that you need to know about and be aware of. A, a container is, if you think of like a shipping container, if you've ever seen large shipping containers coming into ports of entry, they have these uniform boxes that, uh, that eat on the, um, the container. And if you open up any one of those containers, what's inside it would vary greatly. Maybe, you know, a box of electronics or some other things like that. And so containers is a similar thing. It allows you to package up the runtime of your environment and then ship that off and allow it to run on other platforms. So that means if you're building a web, a .NET Core web API project, you can containerize that and then run it on a Linux web host. And that's cool because now you can target AWS, you can target Azure, you can target whatever you want and still run your application on that environment. And so what when we talk about Docker, you got to realize that Docker is a, a company that makes the containers for you. And so there's a lot of uh, confusion around that, but Docker is a company, but it's also a philosophy in how you should do it because containerization also removes the words, hey, it ran on my machine. And so like you get that a lot if you've rolled out code, the guy built it, it ran on his local host, but when he rolled it over to the server, it's kind of different. Or if you've ever worked in a server farm and all the boxes are sort of the same or completely different, and so your mileage may vary. And so containers allows you to uniform all of that and roll those out in a very consistent and a precise manner. So it's going to help you with your deployments, help you with rollouts, and also allow you to target other OSs that you didn't think were possible before. So if you haven't looked into Docker's and container, you need to because it has broad support in .NET Core and the .NET Standard Framework and allows you to target those environments. 
Let's wrap up the five things that you need to be aware of going forward. So we talked a little bit about a WebAssembly and Blazor and how that's going to change the way we may build web applications. We look into HTTP2 and how that's going to change our web APIs or our services that we're writing. We also looked into Azure Functions and a new way to put deploy small amounts of code to, without rolling out a whole web server. We also talked about the death of web forms and how that's really not a problem, it's more of an opportunity, and we hope you embrace that. And lastly, we looked at Docker and containerization, and hopefully that'll help you with your deployments, your rollout, and insulating yourself from changes as you roll out your code. And we've also got some links down here in the bottom of the video that'll help you on your search. So we want you to be able to get to links and find good information. If you feel like we've missed a technology or you have a five list of your own, hey, leave it in a comment. We would love to interact with you there. And um, maybe that'll be the basis for a future video or something like that. But tell us what we missed or what you liked. Leave a comment, like the video, and please subscribe so we can bring you more great content. Well, anyway, I hope this helps. Good luck and keep coding.